Church bells were ringing through the townships of Cape Town. This was the unusual news that reached the reporter Gerald Shaw on Friday, April 1st, 1960. A child was dead, somehow shot at a roadblock in Nyanga, a haunting scene which was to inspire one of South Africa's most powerful pieces of poetry. It was written by Ingrid Jonker. No story I have researched has left me with a lump in my throat quite as pronounced as this. For the story of Ingrid Jonker reflects so many of the complexities and aching emotions of the South African people. She carried these burdens and converted its energy into vivid, timeless prose. She wrote beautifully. Her words are flamboyant and rhythmic, reflecting a unique beauty in the Afrikaans language. But her words also spoke of profound human truths, universal concepts which have enabled her work to be translated and reimagined in an extraordinary number of languages and formats. Ingrid's mother was of old French Huguenot extraction, born Beatrice Saliers in 1905. She studied music at Stellenbosch University, where she met and fell in love with a theology student called Abraham Jonker. They were married in 1930 and soon had their first child, a daughter called Anna. Their marriage was tumultuous. On the one hand, they had a deep love for one another, but there was also fracture and jealousy. Further, Beatrice had struggled with mental health, eventually seeking professional help whilst seven months pregnant with their second child. Around this time, and in a bout of jealousy, Abraham speculated that this second child was not his. She left him. Taking young Anna, Beatrice made for her parents' farm along the Orange River in the Northern Cape. Here, the new baby would be born. This was 1933. This was Ingrid Jonker. Ingrid and Anna would be raised by their mother and grandparents, who as a collective soon moved down to Durbanville near Cape Town. But when Ingrid's grandfather passed away, the four women were left in financial strain. This was the Great Depression, and they now settled at a then fishing village in Gordon's Bay. Accordingly, Ingrid and Anna grew up without the luxury of money. But freedom they had in great abundance, as they were given near free reign to play on the beach in the felt and amongst the surrounding pine forests. This they did, skipping school in order to explore the surrounds, burying secret treasures in the sand, playing with animals, making homes amongst the trees, reading and letting their imagination run wild. Such was their lack of classroom attendance that the school had assumed the family had again moved on. And when, with shock, the community became aware of the girl's truancy, Beatrice responded that, well, she couldn't think of a better way for her girls to spend the day. Beatrice was, however, still struggling with mental illness. As such, Ingrid's grandmother emerged as a central figure. She was a petite woman with deep green eyes, deeply devout, as her Huguenot roots would suggest, but she preferred to worship amongst the Cape Cudded community and through the Apostolic Church, which exuded more life than the old, stern Dutch Reformed Church. For she carried a spark, something undefined but unconventional, a trait inherited by her daughter Beatrice, and then again passed on generously to her granddaughter, Ingrid. It was in attending church with her grandmother that Ingrid grew to love hymns, and with that to appreciate the power of lyrics. She remembered occasions where she, her grandmother, and the entire congregation would end up in tears as they launched into hymn after beautiful hymn. Inspired by these lyrics, and encouraged by her grandmother, Ingrid took to writing, with her first poetry published in the school magazine when she was just six. Unfortunately, Beatrice's mental health was deteriorating, and she was eventually institutionalized, and shortly thereafter diagnosed with cancer. A traumatic experience for the young girls, whose bond to their grandmother now grew tighter. But time was running out on the freedoms that they had so enjoyed in Gordon's Bay. Beatrice died in August of 1944. Ingrid was then just 11. She wrote beautifully of her dying mother. My mother, stervent, was so sonnig so sy leven heerspeesie, so geheime, so verrassend, so teer. Her father, Abraham, arrived to collect the girls four months later. With that, 
they lost a second mother in the space of a few months, for they would rarely see their grandmother again. Abraham had by now remarried and lived in Plumstead in the southern suburbs of Cape Town with their two younger children. This would be a difficult transition. The freedoms of Gordons Bay were now reined in by the strict Calvinist conformities demanded by the Afrikaner middle class. And the importance of this conformity was exacerbated by the fact that Abraham was emerging as a public figure. For he had transitioned from journalism and was instead making headway into politics, winning an opposition seat in Parliament in 1948 under Jan Smuts's United Party. By then, Anna and Ingrid were attending Weinberg Girls High School, a prominent Cape Town English school. Here, her writing continued to develop, and she submitted her first collection of poems called Nadi Swimmer. It was rejected for publication, but it did capture the attention of DJ Opperman, a renowned figure in Afrikaans literature who emerged as an early mentor to Ingrid. By 1951, the 18-year-old Ingrid wanted to move out. For Ingrid, Plumstead had been a house, not a home, and she had tried before to escape, for she felt little love. Her sister Anna was already in Johannesburg, she had a strained relationship with her stepmother, and her father Abraham was, by account, a difficult man. Ingrid completed a secretarial course after school, through which she gained financial independence. But her real passion remained poetry. She was developing her craft and building confidence in her own style. There is something that draws us to people like Ingrid Jonker, for she carried a strength of conviction which allowed her to transcend those great human barriers of prudence and expediency and tradition. Instead, she followed her heart. She was flawed, yes, but those flaws were so very human, derived from her instinct for love and spontaneity and honesty, and then emphasized by the then rigid, deeply conservative system in South Africa. Ingrid would publish her first book of poems, aptly named Ontvluchtung, Escape, in 1956. That same year, aged 23, she married Peter Fenter and moved up to Johannesburg with him. Their daughter, Simone, was born the following year in 1957. However, painfully that marriage was to break down and she and Simone would soon move back down to Cape Town. By now, Ingrid's father, Abraham, had crossed the floor and joined the ruling National Party where, with great irony, he would be appointed as the chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee responsible for the censorship of publications, art and entertainment. Ingrid, meanwhile, believed in, indeed lived for, freedom of expression. And so this strange predicament dictated that Ingrid's already tepid relationship with her father was further distanced by an ideological rift, which would ultimately result in her father's formal rejection of her, a source of great anguish for Ingrid. But there was another important layer tugging at this story. For the struggle movement had gained tremendous momentum through the passive resistance campaigns of the 1950s, which were focusing increasingly on those much-hated passbooks. These protests came to a tragic head at Sharpville and Lange on March 21, 1960, sending the country into a state of fear and panic and mourning. A week later, on Wednesday, March 30th, Philip Rosana had led a march of 30,000 people into Cape Town. This prompted an official state of emergency. Two days later came news of the ringing church bells. A baby shot dead at a roadblock in Nyanga. The incident moved Ingrid deeply. It invoked her own experiences of bereavement as a child, and she felt something universal in this story. In the child she saw her own Simon, and in the mother she saw every mother in South Africa. And these concepts she harnessed, with her by now considerable skill, into a poem reflecting her belief that nothing is ever wholly lost, that there remains always an eternal energy, these the last four lines. Die kunt wat net wou speel in die son by Nyanga as oorals. Die kunt wat een man geword het trek dier die ganse Afrika. Die kunt wat een reus geword het reis dier die hele wereld. Sonar a pass. Emotionally, Ingrid was, however, deeply strained. Failed relationships, coupled with her father's rejection and a country in turmoil, 
saw her fall into depression. In 1961, she sought professional help from the same institution as her mother. Here, she would dream of the simpler days of her youth. Oit hiri Falkenberg het ek ontvlug, en dink my nou in Gordon's baai terug. By 1963, she had captured her ideas into a new volume of poetry called Rook en Oker, Smoke and Ochre. Predictably, leavers of the state were unimpressed, but, by contrast, it was to receive great acclaim from the literary community, a chasm in opinion which was indicative of a then-growing divide within the Afrikaner community. Ingrid, who had by now come of age, joined a group called the Sestigers, a literary movement founded by André Brink and Brayton Breitenbach which was looking to use the Afrikaans language in a fresh manner in order to tackle the social issues of the time, notably the injustice of apartheid. It was a multiracial, bohemian, rebellious collection of artists and writers, a phenomenal generation inspired by the tension of the time, including Etienne Leroux, Jan Rabi, Adam Small and Elsa Hubert, who sadly passed away this week. Julie Gardner described their works aptly as literature in exile in its own country. Roek and Oker would win the Afrikaans Press Booksellers Prize, and the considerable prize money that came with it helped Ingrid to realize her dream of traveling to Europe. However, with failed relationships, notably Jack Cope and André Brink, weighing on her, she cut her trip short and returned back to South Africa, carrying the emotional burden of a difficult life. The truth is, I can no longer go on living like this, she wrote to Jack Cope in June of 1965. A month later, in the early hours of July 19th, Ingrid Jonker walked into the sea at Three Anchor Bay in Cape Town and drowned. She was 31 years old. At face value, Ingrid Jonker's story is a tragedy from start to finish. This is not the case. Ingrid was young and independent, talented and very successful. Her daughter Simone remembers her mother as being a light, wonderful, warm person. She bottled up her deeper, darker emotions, saving them instead for her pen. Her generous smile and the empathy of her ink touched the hearts of many. She was a beautifully complex human being. Abraham insisted on a formal funeral conducted by the Reformed Church. Ingrid's friends were forbidden from reading Ingrid's poems, while the Dermony referred to Ingrid as a young housewife. The image stirred by this wintry Cape memorial is the story of a complex land. On the one side, Abraham and family. On the other, this eclectic, silenced group of artists mourning the loss of a young giant. But nothing, as Ingrid whispered, is ever wholly lost. On May 24, 1994, Nelson Mandela presented his first official State of the Nation address in Parliament. In it, he described Ingrid Jonker as an Afrikaner woman who had transcended a particular experience and become a South African, an African, and a citizen of the world. He then quoted an excerpt from her poem, Die Kunt. The child is not dead. The child lifts his fists against his mother who shouts Africa. The child is not dead, not at Langa, nor at Nyanga, nor at Orlando, nor at Sharpville, nor at the police post at Philippi, where he lies with a bullet through his brain. The child is present at all assemblies and law-giving. The child peers through the windows and houses and into the hearts of mothers. This child, who only wanted to play in the sun at Nyanga, is everywhere. The child grown to a man treks on through all Africa. The child grown to a giant journeys over the whole world without a pass. <laughs>